Hello and welcome. Wow, it looks like I was going to say we're going to wait until five o'clock to get started, but it looks like it's five o'clock right now. So uh, we might as well go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Shannon Doyle and I'm with LSS Financial Counseling. I am joined here tonight by Molly Kennedy, who is from Mid, uh, Mid Minnesota Federal Credit Union. And uh, we are presenting to you tonight Money Management Basics uh, workshop that um, is being sponsored through Mid Minnesota Federal Credit Union. Uh, Molly, was there any anything you needed to say for Mid Minnesota? Um, no, I just want to to thank everybody for coming tonight. Appreciate it. And I hope you get something out of it. And we are going to be recording it. So you can, um, if you would like to go back to anything, it will be out on our website within the next couple of days. So just to let you know. Great, great. And I too will, um, I always follow up with some information, a copy of the presentation and other resources if anyone is so inclined to care for those resources or want to use them, I guess I should say actually. And if you if you got, I did send out a reminder notice that had some handouts attached to it, uh, which, which I would like to use this evening. I may be able to attach them, to attach them in the chat. I'll try it doesn't always work but uh we'll do our best with the uh, uh technology here um sometimes sometimes there's heavy firewalls sometimes there's heavy firewalls um in and uh in with zoom and and other other um uh security systems so we just have to make sure that we can access okay all right. So just so you know, I want to tell you a little bit. Um, if you are a member of Min Minnesota Federal Credit Union, you have a benefit as a member through um, LSS Financial Counseling. It's called Financial Choice. Uh, what that is, is it's up to six free one-on-one -on -one sessions with any of our counselors for yourself or your immediate family. Um, we we work with people. We're, we're by phone right now, but we do have offices in Brainerd um, and uh, uh, throughout the state. We have offices also in Wilmer, in Mankato, Duluth, uh, one office in Virginia, <laughs> and uh, the Twin Cities, and um, even a counselor over in Superior. So uh, we're pretty accessible. We also have a lot of resources online. So if you are so interested, please feel free to visit um, our website and learn more about our resources. And if you find that you would like to meet with somebody one-on-one -on -one after our time tonight, please feel free to um, call also the toll free number and you can schedule an appointment with them. You just have to let them know you're a, a member of Mid Minnesota Federal Credit Union. Okay, um, so that that can be a great service. Uh, so I don't um, when I do a workshop, especially a virtual one, um, I want to keep you engaged and interested in what we're talking about. And so I have uh, found some ways to make our workshops a little more interactive so that you're not just sitting there listening to me talking for an hour because that can get a little boring, right? Um, so we use a program called Menti. Well, it's Mentimeter, but um, you can, if you are not on a cell phone, if you are on a computer, um, you can pull out your cell phone and go to menti.com and enter the code 41775987. Uh, you can also um, uh, click on this link that I just put it in the chat right now, and that will bring you right to that website. So it'll open up in a new browser window, window for you. And the nice thing about Menti is that you don't have to switch back and forth between the two screens, between Zoom and Menti, because the uh, presentation is uploaded into Menti, so you can follow along right there, because uh, I know that can be a pain to kind of switch between two different screens. Um, but I do keep I, I do have the Zoom screen up for those who don't care to go to Menti because not everybody wants to, and that's okay. You're not required to participate. It just, uh, I think, keeps it a little more interesting and um, sometimes a little easier to learn things. Um, 
one of the nice things I like about Menti too is that there is a spot where you can enter questions. And when you put those questions in, they will be anonymous. Um, and I, I can share them with everybody, but your name won't be attached to it. And sometimes that's a nice thing to have when we're talking about money because sometimes you might have a question that you're embarrassed about or shy about or something like that. And I just want you to know that there are no such thing as a stupid question especially when we're meeting today, okay? Um, you can also use the Zoom chat box to ask any questions or make comments or participate in that way too. Uh, some people are more comfortable renaming themselves in the in the Zoom in the Zoom meeting. But just so you know, this this workshop is being recorded, but but it doesn't record any of your names, okay? Cuz I know that, you know, people like to have their privacy protected. So, I want to make sure that you know that your name and video are not being recorded at this time. Just, just the presentation and um, I, I believe what ends up on the screen is, is me <laughs> and the presentation. So uh, I just don't want you to feel shy about that. Okay. Any questions about the logistics before we get down to the nuts and bolts of things? Okay, and since we are such a small group too, please feel free if you know how to do it um, uh, to raise your hand um, with your Menti controls. If you do have a question or you want to make a comment, and I will be happy to call on you and uh, on, and uh, and hear from you. I would love to hear from you. Okay, all right. So let's start with just understanding when I'm talk when we talk about financial well being or money management, really, because they all kind of uh, uh, go together. Other, right. Um, it's important to just understand, you know, let's define what it is we're talking about. So the goal of this webinar is to get you started on building a strong foundation for your finances. Um, and the pyramid, I like to talk about it as sort of, you could talk about it as maybe a roadmap, you know, um, for uh, uh, just where you might want to get to or how you might want to get there, um, you know, and and really just defining what good is or, or what uh, financial well-being is. So when we look at the pyramid, you know, all, all everything starts with spending less than you earn which these days is pretty challenging, right? It's, it's not always that easy, but that is the foundation of all financial well-being is to be able to spend less than you're earning. Um, so for some of us, it can be a consistent challenge and maybe we're just right here at the spot, you know, and, and feel like we just can't ever move ahead. Um, but if you're feeling like you're at a pretty good place where you know you're spending less than you earn, then you would step up to this, the second foundation, which is having a minimum amount of savings. You know, we, we encourage people to have at least $1,000 in, in a, a very liquid savings account. So really just, you know, at your bank. Um, Kind of, it's it's sort of like having your own line of credit, right? Only you don't have to pay interest back. Um, you're not trying to make money off of this money. It's just there in case you have a car repair or you know have to call a plumber or something like that. There's a lot of uh, emergencies or unexpected expenses in life that we can manage with a thousand dollars, and then that way it can help us to prevent debt. Um, which brings us to the third level, which is if you have any high interest debts, anything over 8% is what we consider high interest, um, then you want to focus on paying those off. Uh, once you have that little bit of money in savings. And the reason why we say that is because, again, it just goes back to if you have those surprise expenses that normally would end up on a credit card, um, if it, it makes it really difficult to pay off debt if you still have to use it to cover those expenses, you know, and not, not that there's anything wrong with that because it happens to all of us, but this is just, you know, building this uh, pyramid of financial well-being. Once you have that higher interest debt paid off, um, then you can focus on building that three to six months of living expenses. You know that emergency savings that we're all told we should have, but very, very few of us do. Um, 
you know, that three to six months of living expenses so that if you, um, if, if you or your spouse or partner ends up losing a job or having reduced income, at least it's not going to be a complete financial disaster for your household um, in that moment if you're able to have that three to six months of living expenses saved up, right? After you hit that level, then you focus on paying off those lower interest debts. So car loans, student loans, mortgage maybe. Um, and then way, way out there in the future, maybe for some of us, um, uh, maybe others are already there. This is the hard part with workshops, of course, because we're always all in different, on, on different levels. We're at different points, right, um, on, this, on this journey. Um, but then down the road, you know, being able to once once you have no debts, you have that little bit of savings built up, you're spending less than you earn and you can put more towards retirement. Now, all along this road, all along this path, while you're building your pyramid, we do encourage people to uh, focus on maxing that match if you have an employer sponsored retirement program. OK, so that's just a, a quick overview of uh, financial well-being and the way that we look at it at LSS Financial Counseling. And as you can see, they, each of these layers build upon each other. Um, but we also know that, you know, as we go through life, um, is sometimes for some of us, it's week to week, others, it's month to month. You might have a month where it's great. And yeah, you're totally spending less than you earn. You're, you're you know, you're earning a lot and, and then something could happen and you're going to be back down to, oh, now I'm, now I'm spending more than I earn. And that is one of the frustrations about learning to manage money, right? It's, it's one of those uh, levels of acceptance of we just have to accept that sometimes we are we are going to fall back into that place where oh I was getting so far I was paying off my credit card debt I had a little bit of money in savings and then bam something happened and now I'm back at oh I got to rebuild that thousand dollars it's and and it can feel like a cycle. Um, but better to have that than to not have it if you do run into those surprise expenses. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to you. I would like to hear from all of you and you can enter your answer into Menti or you can enter it into the chat in Zoom. Or if you just would rather talk, feel free to raise your hand um, and we, we can just have a verbal discussion. But um, if you could change one thing about the way you manage money, what would it be? Let's see, and I think I will just do a little countdown timer here. Let's take let's take 30 seconds to answer that. All right, Penny says she would stick to her budget. That's one of the hardest things, isn't it? Sticking to the budget, yes. Steven would like to have a better plan. All right, Dusty wants to save more, spend less on wants. That's a hard thing too. Uh, let's see, I'll give you a few more seconds if anyone else was still trying to type something in. Then we have an anonymous here in um, Menti, sending part of your check directly to your savings account. Yes, oh, that's great. We are actually gonna talk about that today, yeah. So great, all right. Um, so when you're thinking about money management, it's really helpful to know. I mean, most of us have an idea like, I need to change this or, or I want to do this better or I want to do this differently. Right. And and um, so so this is why I asked that question. And, and sometimes we just don't know. We don't know where to start. So if you look at the um, pyramid or maybe if you if you don't know where to start and you see someone else's idea of what they want to do, sometimes it can inspire something in you. So it's always really helpful to, for us to hear from one another, too. Um, so let's start off with the basics, which is budgeting, right? So when it comes to managing your money, um, we have to keep in mind that the why of money management is so that you can reach your goals in life, right? So 
And, you know, some of you were just saying what it is you'd like to change, but um, I'm not here to tell you what your goals should be, right? But to offer guidance uh, for some places you might want to start and some strategies for getting there. Um, so, uh, so let's think about this. Uh, when, when we are starting a budget, uh, the most important thing is to look at accurate income, okay? And, and what do I mean by that? I mean, it, what I mean is like, let's only use only budget the dollars that are already earned because when we start out uh, when we start out budgeting, we really, uh, most of us have been taught to budget as a projection, right? And like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure I'm going to make this much money in the month and I have these many bills or, you know, these are my bills and, and these are my expenses. And um, so I'm just going to look, does it balance at the end of the month, right? So that is more, that is more of a system of assessing your cash flow, right? So when we're assessing our cash flow, um, that is just kind of looking at, these are my income, this is my income, these are my expenses, how much do I have left over, right? How much do I have left over at the end of uh, the month or if, if all my projections come true, right? But what I'm asking you to do when you're looking at accurate income is something a little different than what we're doing because what, what you really, or then what we've been taught as, as we've been um, uh, throughout our lives, or if you were even taught, because a lot of us weren't taught about managing money. Um, so what we need to focus on here is uh, first, you got to start with just listing all of your expenses, right? Um, so when you are creating a budget, you have to know what your expenses are, but we also have to know how much we spend on things. Um, and so it's important to think of some way to track it. But also we want you to think about um, uh, when, when, you're, when that income comes in, you have to make a plan for it each paycheck. So sometimes it can be really helpful to start with something that's just like this. It's a payday plan. Uh, so I am going to enter these uh, forms into, these are the forms, the forms I was talking about that I sent to you all earlier. And uh, I'm going to try to enter these into the chat and see if I can get them transferred over to you. Um, let's see, I just sent one up. Please let me know if you can open that uh, or if you're having problems with it. Um, otherwise, please feel free to go to your email that you registered with and um, we can, you should be able to uh, get that um, open from the email too. Okay. So after, after you have your accurate income, and of course, you're going to want to list all your income from all sources, right? Um, then you make a list of your expenses. And, you know, first check to make sure that everything balances. If it doesn't balance, you might, that's, that's a cue to you that, you know, you might have to make some small changes to things, whether it's, you know, reducing the costs on, on whatever you can, um, or if it's, oh gosh, do I have to find a way to make a little more income? Though neither of those things are easy to do, right? Um, they're actually the one thing that we all hate to do because if we have to reduce something from our budget, then it feels like a huge loss, right? And going out to uh, work a second job or something like that, it's, we don't always have the time. Maybe, you know, you're a parent or, um, you know, you just don't have the time for that. Maybe you're in school. So there can be lots, lots of um, obstacles that get in the way of being able to balance out that budget. So, in the meantime, until you can come up with a solution, uh, then it's just about using that accurate money, accurate dollars, your paycheck to paycheck plan and figuring out how you can assign a job to each dollar, okay? So we're gonna do a practice. Uh, well, I'm gonna give you a chance to do this for yourself just to kind of get, get get started on your own. So I want you to be able to leave with a good start towards um, towards uh, working on putting a budget together or, you know, thinking about what your priorities are. But, but I mentioned 
earlier that when you are looking at your bills and your expenses, sometimes, you know, I think all of us, we think that we know what we spend on groceries, what we spend on food. And some, some people do, some people are very good at tracking, but if you have never tracked your expenses before, then it's really important to be able to figure out a way to know what it is that you're spending. Now, maybe you figure that out just by, you know, making a plan for your paycheck and realizing, oh, wow, that plan was off because I guess I spend more on groceries than I thought I did. Um, or, you know, you could uh, look at uh, previous two to three months of uh, credit card statements or bank statements that show you where your money's been going. Um, other people like to use online apps like Mint. Um, uh, some people like to track things in Excel and other people like to use just old fashioned paper and pencil. So it's really up to you. Um, there's no one right way to track your expenses. There's actually no one right way to budget either. But the important thing is that you know your income, you know your expenses, you, you, or you know your bills, right? You know your income, you know your bills, um, you know... Uh, about what you're going to spend or need to spend on gas and groceries and all those needs, once you can figure that out, then you can make a plan for um, the extra things that might kind of trip you up as you go, you know, so that makes it easier to stick to that budget, right? Okay. So your turn, we're going to take a little chance, a little minute here, we're going to take about three minutes. And um, I, I want you to click on the monthly budget fillable um, app, and it's going to bring up this, uh, or not app, sorry, <laughs> PDF file, and it will bring up this uh, form that you can fill out. So I want you to just take three minutes, start filling out all the expenses that you know absolutely that you have that you know the number for not where you have to guess but where you just you know that number like your rent or your car payment or something like that okay ready and go Okay, so there's about one minute left and this is always the hard part because I can't see you. We're not in the same room, so I don't know if you guys are about done or.
<laughs> Thank you for letting me know, Christine. Oh boy, that's terrible. Um, okay, so what I was asking you is, uh, uh, first of all, I was like, how did that go? Uh, did it feel comfortable? Were you worried about it when you were entering the expenses? How did it work out for you? Okay, that's okay. That's okay. If nobody wants to say anything, that's fine. Um, so now, okay, good. So you have a start. Awesome. All right. So the next thing I want you to do, we're just going to take a couple more minutes here to think back over the previous month or two. Um, and think of any irregular or unexpected expenses that came up. So for example, I don't know, maybe maybe you had to uh, replace some clothing or get some new clothing for the new season, or maybe there was a birthday party or a wedding celebration or a car repair or something like that. So think about that and then enter those numbers, enter that surprise expense. And I'm just gonna give you like a minute and a half for this one. So go, go ahead and think about that, surprise expenses. Okay, we got just about 15 seconds left for that here. Okay, great. Um, so uh, how was that? Uh, sometimes it could be a little more difficult to think about those irregular or surprise expenses, but if you had some in the past couple of months, it can also be something that you go, oh, wow, that really threw off my budget for that month. Or, you know, I know I'm, I'm looking here at the list and I'm thinking pet expenses. You know, we just had to uh, stock up on the old heart guard and uh, uh, next guard for, for our dog, um, you know, and, and I usually like to buy that like three or six months at a time. And that's, that, that can, you know, it, it adds up. And, uh, you know, that's not always something that I have planned in my regular budget, right? So when I have something like that come up, it is, um, it's, uh, well, I try to plan for it monthly so that it's not as big of a hit, or, you know, that would be something that could come out of that minimum thousand dollars that you would try to save um, to avoid the credit card debt, all right? Um, does anybody else have any sort of uh, uh, comments or questions or uh, observations that uh, came up while you were doing this exercise? Okay. Um, well, I just want to then show you very quickly. Uh, I, the other form I, I posted in the chat here is a payday planner. And a really nice way to use this is uh, if you're focused on just um, using, you know, or 
making a plan for just the dollars that you have, uh, the way that you would start with this would be, you know, you enter your pay date, um, and then you say, I don't, I, you know, um, oh, this is 950 is going to be my pay. Um, and then you go through and you'll see here, this is what I love about this. Um, you go, oh, okay, so I have 950 in cash available to me right now, we'll just say. Um, and uh, so you're going to say, oh, all right, well, I've got, you know, rent and, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what rent is in your area. So I'm just going to say 650. Uh, once you enter that, it will. Oh boy, that did something wrong. That's not supposed to work that way. <laughs> of course, it's, of course, it's going to go wrong. Um, so this fillable form it was supposed to i'm not sure why it's doing that sorry you guys i'm not giving you a very good example here okay there we go okay so now it works so we have rent 650 um you know and then gas oh gas is probably going to be a lot right um uh we'll just say gas is a hundred i guess you know, hopefully you get paid every two weeks or something like that. But and you see, it's nice because it re, it it helps you to know. Okay, have I overspent in this pay period? So really asking yourself, what do I need to cover from this paycheck to the next paycheck, right? And that can that can really help. Um, it just helps you to make a plan. But once you have that plan, then you also need a way to track if you are really following it. Like I thought I would spend 100 on gas, but actually I spent 125. So how is that going to work out, right? So what if I put in um, 125? You know, this system will let me know if I go over. So then I could say groceries. Two hundred. See, and now I know. Oops. Okay, that's negative. Um, so I know that uh, I probably have to stop spending money then. You know, but of course, the problem with that is that expenses don't always stop at that point, and so that's when we end up kind of using credit cards too for that. Um, so that is just one example of a system of systems that you can use. But like I said, there are many, many different systems when it comes to money management basics. And the real trick is that when it comes to managing money, it's it's not about how we manage. It's it's more or less about the choices we make about how we're going to spend our money, and you know, less it is less than about how we're going to manage it. And and I'm going to talk about that a little bit in in a little bit more um, in a little bit. <laughs> but uh, first, I want to touch on savings because, of course, savings is essential, right? And why is it essential? Well, it's essential. It's it's essential because the kind of savings that I'm talking about right now can be thought of more as, like I said earlier, that debt prevention or creating your own personal line of credit instead of using the bank's money and having to pay them back with high interest rate or maybe overdraft fees or something like that. Um, another way to think of it is as a put and take account, right? So you're just putting that money in there until you know you have to take it out, right? Um, because unexpected and irregular expenses happen all the time. So you want enough to cover your surprise expenses, like the car repairs or home repairs. Um, but um, but that's just that's that's really what you're trying to focus on with this first minimum start of savings. And this is just um, a statistic to show that if you if you don't have a thousand dollars in saving or if you never have, um, you are not alone. You're not alone in that. Seventy percent of all of us uh, can't pay an emergency thousand dollar bill or a surprise expense without using credit. So it's very common, and which means it's also nothing to. Uh, it's nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed about. You know, we all end up using debt at some point in our life. The idea is to try to get to the point where you where you don't have to. And it's not always a quick point. It's not always something that happens uh, very as as quickly as we would like it to. Um, 
So uh, that's why we're talking about strategies today, right? So I just posted another worksheet um, in the chat and it is uh, just, it's focused on saving success. So if you are a person who it helps to really write things down, then um, I, I encourage you to fill out, to fill out this form as, as we go. Um, because when you are build, trying to build savings, um, it is important to have a goal and, and really just starting small, right? So set one single goal. The first thing, okay, you're going to do right now is pick what you want to save for. You can write it in that sheet. You can write it on a note paper or just think about it. But what is it? What do you want to save for? Not what I'm telling you you should save for, but what do you want to save for? And here's the other thing. It's not about how much you save. It is about what you're saving for. So here are a few things to keep in mind. You choose that goal. However, if you have more than one goal, pick the one that feels the most important to you. Because a lot of times we want to do everything all at once, but it's very difficult to be able to do everything all at once. So pick that one single goal that you want to focus on or the most important goal to you. Okay, now try to picture it clearly. Okay, for, for example, uh, if you want to save for an emergency fund, ask yourself, what kind of problems can it or will it protect you from? Or if you, you know, let's say you want to move out, you're, you're uh, still living at home with your parents or, um, and you want to move out, think about what kind of place do you want to move to? And then thinking about, you know, how much is it going to cost you to move and how much do you need to save up? So um, make it a goal. This is the other thing. Make this goal a goal that's possible because you save. All right. So you're looking for a sort of savings goal, like buying a new computer or, you know, uh, that emergency savings or, you um, uh, something like that, but not a life goal, not a life goal, like getting a new job or getting my degree or something like that. Okay. Although a lot of times life goals often require savings goals too. Right. Okay. So if you have that goal, if you, if you've kind of been able to picture it, take a moment to picture it as realistically as you can. And think about how will you feel once you reach your goal? Where will you be? What will you be doing? Uh, who else will be there? What will they be doing? You know, just, just really try to picture it. In fact, think, you could think of it this way. You have reached your savings goal. What are you doing? You're with some friends and they snap a, self, a selfie or a picture of everybody what's going on, right? Who is there with you? How are you feeling? What does this picture look like? Sometimes when you do that, when you envision um, uh, where things will be once you reach your goal, it can make that goal feel more achievable. So, so it's, it's a psychological exercise. So, so, but the very first thing is setting that goal, picturing it and make sure that goal is something that's possible because you save, right? The next step you have to think of is how often can you save, All right? So of course the best time to save is right when the money comes in. So if you get a paycheck every two weeks, you should save every two weeks, right? Uh, if you get it every month, save every month. If it's once a week, once a week is when you save. If you don't have regular income or if you're a tipped employee or your income goes up and down, um, again, try to save, um, when you get paid, but also if it's with tips, maybe try to save a specific amount every week. Um, and you know that that can help move you towards that savings goal. If you have a direct deposit paycheck, the best way, the best way to save is to automatically divert some of that into a savings account. Um, but of course, if you if you if you set that up, you also want to be careful not to incur overdraft fees uh, if there's not enough in your checking account, right? Because then that'll defeat your savings purpose. So um, 
but automatic deposit, direct deposit is the best way to successfully save just because it's already, you already made that decision. I'm going to save this every paycheck. It's going to go into my checking or my savings account, and I'm going to try my best to not spend it. Um, all right. And this is the crazy thing because it adds up really quickly. All right. So um, even even if you picked a really small amount, let's say let's say if you get paid every other week and you decided I am going to save twenty dollars a paycheck. OK, well, that might not sound like a whole lot, but 20 times 26. Oops, sorry. 20 times 26 is $520. So if you just saved $20 every paycheck, you would have uh, $520 after a year. If you wanted to reach that $1,000 example um, and you get paid every two weeks, you would only you would you would only have to up that. Well, you'd have to double the $20. Basically, it would be $38 a paycheck. Um, and sometimes it, that means that you might have to adjust other things in your budget to reach that savings goal, right? So it's important to remember that it, it is really easy to be optimistic about how much we can save. Um, and that can make it harder to get started, and, and which sounds contradictory, but it's because a lot of times we set that amount too high at first. So start with something small. Um, the best way to start is with an easy, realistic amount and to get yourself an early win, right? Um, the more money you see piling up in, in your savings account, the more motivated you are to keep saving. Uh, so take a moment to, if you wrote down an amount, if you wrote down something on that sheet, just take a moment to double check if the amount feels manageable. If the, if the number you end up with feels too high, then make it smaller to start with. You know, if $20 is too much, make it 15. You know, the important thing is just to start. Um, uh, you know, so, or you might be in the different position. If it's not going to get you to where you want to be fast enough, make it a bigger amount. Um, just make sure that it's still easy to do. You know, um, uh, saving success is not about saving quickly. It's about slowly building things up over time. Okay. So you always get to adjust your uh, goals if they're not working for you. That's the beautiful thing about it. All right. Also, just I want to say one quick word before we move on here um, uh, to the last section of our talk tonight. But um, a lot of employers uh, do offer uh, employer retirement savings plans. So besides your minimal emergency savings, we all if we can need to be contributing towards our retirement, um, especially if you're young. A lot of times when we're young, we're kind of thinking, oh, I have all the time in the world to save for retirement. But what, what you may or may not know is that when you're younger, uh, time is what is, it's your most valuable asset because if you start contributing just 1% of your salary when you're younger um, towards your retirement account, especially if your employer has a match program, and then let's say you, you tick that up every year just by 1% until you reach your employer's match or maximum that they will match, um, that is a really powerful way to, first of all, um, uh, build that savings, right? It's tax-free money. You don't pay taxes on it now while it's going into your retirement account. So, so it reduces your taxable income. Um, but also, uh, your, if your employer has a match program, and let's say they match 50 cents on the dollar, or maybe they match dollar for dollar up to a certain percentage of your, of your salary or your hourly wage, um, that is a 50% return on your money, um, regardless of how uh, regardless of how the stock markets or your investments do. So um, employer match programs are part of your salary, is part of your benefit when you're, when, when you're working for an employer. So once again, 
if they're if they're asking you to save four percent, but you're like, I can only do one percent. That's okay. Just start off small and get bigger as you go, especially when you're younger, because that gives you have more time to build that up higher. All right. And for those of you, if you uh, are one of the fifty uh, percent, or what is it? I heard today it's. Uh, uh, Maybe it's, I think it's around 50% of employees in the US that don't have an employer sponsored plan. Um, you can open a individual retirement account. Um, and now I can't tell you what type of retirement account to open, um, or I mean specifically where to open it or what to invest in or things like that. But I am going to paste here more information about what's called a Roth IRA. And uh, Roth IRAs are, are nice because they're kind of like a savings account, um, meaning that you can take your contributions back out without a penalty, um, but um, uh, you, you pay taxes on the money now. You don't have to pay taxes on the money. Like let's say if you retire, you wait to take it out until when you retire. Uh, the money is tax-free when you take it out down the road. So, um, so a Roth IRA can be a less risky way to build some retirement savings. And, you know, after all, we're all worth that investment. Um, so even if you have to start small, it's good to start. Um, okay, I'll get off my soapbox with that. I, I, I don't mean to sound preachy at all when I, when I talk about that, but, um, but it's just, it's really important. Okay, so small changes. What can you do today? Small changes. Well, um, just like I said before, focus on that one goal at a time. And if you go back to the pyramid, think about where am I on this pyramid? Um, you know, if you still need to work on, on uh, spending less than you earn, focus on that. You know, once you've got that resolved, then focus on, you um, uh, uh, building that small amount of savings, you know, and on up the pyramid. Okay. Um, really just uh, looking at the amount you can easily save. And then like it says here, divide the amount by the number of paychecks you get in a year so that then you can set up direct deposit to savings for that amount. All right. Do we have any questions or suggestions or um, tricks tricks that you all use to kind of save money or cut back on expenses when you are trying to make room for a new goal? Okay, well, if you think of something, please feel free to put it in the chat because, of course, we all can learn from one another. And uh, um, it's, it's, I know, I know that there are people out there who have uh, excellent money management skills, and or you know, maybe you do something that could help somebody else. So please feel free to share if uh, if you have any tips or tricks that work really well for you too. Oh, I love that, Molly. Ask yourself twice before you buy something. Do I really need, is this a need or is it a want, right? Yeah, um, it, that's that's a super important question. Um, so, uh, and that is one of the things that I'm going into right now um, to talk about some concepts and brain tricks that you can use to help others and yourselves keep spending in control. Oh, and Sarah says she has automatic deposit in the savings. Yeah. and. And you don't, that's the funny thing because we do think, oh, I can't, I can't build savings because then, you know, I mean, I'm going to have less to spend, right? Um, and some people honestly do, okay? But sometimes when there's wiggle room and, or if we start small enough, it, you think you're going to miss it, but, but you don't because you get used to it. Yeah. All right. So the first brain trick I'm going to talk about is ending that 
thoughtless spending. Okay. So, and a lot of that is what we've already been talking about today, right? Like plan what you want to spend, track your spending, compare what you spent uh, to what you plan to spend, right? So that's, that's just making sure you're on track. Analyze what's causing the overspending. Evaluate ways to stop the overspending based on your whys, and then commit to your new plan for stopping the autopilot thinking. So what do I mean by all of that? Well, um, behavioral economics, which is which is this really uh, a very interesting field, talks about how we all engage in unconscious or autopilot decisions, and I'm, I'm sure we all have this these decisions about spending. Um, and so, the, of course, the only way to really know what you're spending is to become aware of it. The best way to do this is to track it. Um, so how do you become thoughtful about spending? Well, first you, you become thoughtful about it by planning what you're going to spend. Um, and then by tracking it to make sure that you are on the mark, right? Um, comparing those, that's just tracking again. And then if you are overspending, this is the important thing is why? Why are you overspending in a certain area? Um, my husband and I, we have to talk about this all the time. <laughs> like, okay, why do we keep overspending on groceries? Or I, I mean, of course, because the cost of groceries has gone up, right? But you know, uh, it can be anywhere. It could, why, do, why are we overspending on hobbies? Why do we spend so much on dog toys? You know, that sort of thing. And not in the judgmental voice that I just used, but you know, why, why is this happening? Or, or what can we do differently um, to stop this spending, right? Um, so here's just an example. Uh, my husband and I were curious about how much we spent on dining out. This was pre-COVID, of course. Um, and uh, we decided to track this for three months. And we found out that on average, and this is embarrassing, you guys, but I'm just going to put it out there. We found out that we were spending $500 a month on going out to eat. But if you think about it, I mean, it's hard, especially after COVID um, to, for two people to go out for less than $100. Um, and so we, we had no idea though that we were spending that much. And we're like, oh, well, no wonder we can't save anything um, because all the money that we could be saving is going to going out to eat. Um, so we talked about, you know, well, okay, what, what makes us wanna go out to eat? And we thought about the reasons, you know, yeah, there's socializing. Sometimes we're just tired or, or, or feeling lazy or emotional, right? That emotional spending, we all do it. Um, well, we knew that we're, we weren't about to cut out dining out for forever, but we had to put a limit on it. We couldn't keep spending $500 a month on going out to eat. I don't even know how we were doing that without putting it on credit cards. So, uh, so we said, okay, we are going to go out to eat once a month. It's going to be a special place. It's not just going to be out of boredom or laziness or emotions. And, you know, it, it has to be like a new place or, you know, it can't be impulsive. It has to be a plan. And so really when you stop yourself to start trying to stop yourself to, um, for a minute, just to think about why you're spending and what it is that you could do different can be a huge help. And here's one tool that can help when you are looking at uh, making decisions about spending. Um, it's called using op opportunity costs. So basically, um, opportunity cost uh, is, is a way that you can evaluate a spending decision, large or small. Um, and uh, it basically just refers to looking at the value of what you have to give up in order to choose something else. And I feel like somebody might've mentioned something about that earlier in the chat, um, but that also could have been a different workshop today. Um, but so, so really in a nutshell, it's a value of the road not taken. So think for example, if you spend time and money going to a movie, well then you can't spend that time at home reading a book and you can't spend that money on something else, all right? So. It, like I said, it can be used for big or small purchasing decisions, um, and it can really like help you to evaluate uh, even even just a small spending choice. Like like sometimes you know. Um, 
that thoughtless spending, like, oh, a strawberry smoothie, that looks really good. I think I'm going to go buy that. And then thinking, oh, $7 though. Was there something else I wanted to get today that I could put that towards, you know, um, or, you know, thinking about, well, gosh, it's not just $7. It's also a lot of calories. And, you know, I mean, what, whatever it is that you have to do, but, you know, really thinking about, I know I really want this right now, but is there something else that I either want or need more that um, I could put that money towards instead? Or if I don't spend it today, maybe then I actually have the money to save um, for something bigger down the road. Okay, so opportunity costs, thinking about where does the, um, you know, how, how can I, if I don't spend the money on this thing that I want to spend right now, where else can I spend it? Okay. Um, oops. Sorry about that. And then uh, I went too fast there. Uh, we have, and okay. So the second brain trick to use is our loss aversion bias. So this is really about becoming aware of this. Um, so loss aversion, loss aversion bias is all about this idea that we feel the pain of loss at a much higher level than we do the pleasure from gain. So what does that mean? Well, think about it. For instance, if you lose $100, right? If you lose $100, you're going to feel that pain. And maybe even if it's just $10 or $20, you're going to feel that pain big time. If you find $100 or 10 or 20, you're going to be like, oh, cool. Awesome. $100. And um, but mostly, most of the time, we're going to end up spending that money. And um, and then, you know, we'll have that joy for a minute and then it'll kind of be gone. Right. But we'll probably never forget how much it hurt to lose that $100. Um, so how does this how does this um, translate into our spending decisions? Well, it's really about what you use to spend. So marketers, advertisers, Amazon really knows this, everybody. Google Pay, I pay. Um, is that the easier you make it to pay for something, the less pain we experience as we're paying and the more we are likely to spend. Um, this can be seen in so many examples, like just with um, uh, looking at uh, Amazon's one click or, you know, the apps that we have for Amazon or Zappos or Target or whatever, Chewy, wherever it is that you like to spend money. It, the easier that it is for us to spend, the more we are going to spend. Um, that's why you see a lot of buy now, pay later advertisements and things like that. So put barriers, use cash or or find a way to bring that pain that really like you're trying to inflict pain on yourself when you are spending things. Um, so write it down. Just be aware of that spending. Um, all right. The final one is the anchoring bias. This is your fi final brain trick. All right. Retailers use this on us all the time, okay? It's an anchoring bias. It's this idea that we write, rely heavily on the first bit of information we receive, okay? So, so what they're doing is they anchor us to an idea of how much an item should cost or would cost. Um, we do this with experiences too. If, if your first experience at a restaurant or a date or with a book or an author, if it's bad, you're not likely to read that author again. You're not likely to go back to that restaurant again, uh, including on a second date, right? Um, but if that first ex uh, if that first experience is is good, you know you're more likely to try it out again. Okay. Um, so let's say, this is our example. You're just out shopping one day and you really like cats and you see this cat t-shirt and you're like, oh my gosh, I love this t-shirt. I really need to have it. And you go, oh, but $50, it's cute, but not that cute. And so you put it back on the shelf. Well, then a few days later, you're out, you know, shopping again, but this time your friend wants to go to the fancy schmancy boutique um, that is having a sale and it's one day only. You see that same shirt, but this time it's still $50, but now you're seeing that it is marked down from $300. And all of a sudden you're thinking that's a pretty good deal. Wow. That's like $250 for free that I don't have to spend to have this t-shirt that that other people have paid $300 for. Well, 
now you know, now you feel like you're getting a deal, right? And this would feel like a deal even if you hadn't seen that other shirt the previous day because of that price tag with the markdown. And if, if you've ever shopped at a Marshalls or Nordstrom Rack or, or uh, uh, even Target does this, but anytime there's a discount like that, um, they are using this anchoring bias against us. And so once you become aware of it, you will see it everywhere. But then it's like, okay, so is this really a good deal or not? And the only way to know that is to ask yourself, how much do I value this shirt? Or what, go back to opportunity costs, what would I have to give up in order to buy this shirt? I had a friend who used to ask herself all the time, how many hours do I have to work to make this purchase. And you know that would stop her from making a lot of different purchases. So applying those um, techniques, those brain tricks can really help you to um, uh, combat the impulse to spend, the impulse to buy, all right? So just to sum it up, other small changes that you can make today, just assess your choices, right? What are you giving up to get what it is you want now? Um, is that purchase going to bring value to your life? Just asking yourself these questions, you know, give yourself a cooling off period, even if it's only three big breaths and walking away, right? Um, it, or set a time like, oh, it has to be, you know, 24 hours or 72 hours or whatever it is, but give yourself that cooling off time because when we see things that we want we feel like we have to have them right away and this done just create that system to become painfully aware of the true cost of things um, in other words you make it uh add that pain back so that uh when you're parting from your money even if you are using a credit card you um you're gonna you're you're gonna realize that uh, exactly how much you're spending on those things while you spend it. All right, that is what I have for you today. Um, I hope I hope that you were able to pick up some tips or tricks that you can use uh, when you're on your path to money management. But if you would like some more individual one-on-one -on -one time with one of our counselors, please remember that if you are a member of Mid-Minnesota Federal Credit Union, uh, we are part of their men membership benefit program. And uh, we can offer you up to six free one-on-one -on -one sessions for you and or your immediate